Good morning, everybody. This is Priyanka Vergadia. I'm a customer engineer here at Google, and I am joined by Cheryl today. Um, Cheryl is one of our members of um, our Google Brain team, so I'll let Cheryl introduce herself. Hey, I'm Cheryl. Uh, so I do a lot of uh, machine learning advocacy. I work with cloud, I work with research, and I'm, uh, one of my main collaborations is with the Project Magenta team. Awesome. Brain, yeah. So we are going to be talking a lot about Magenta today and how machine learning and um, Google in general are contributing towards the whole art and culture world. So uh, with that, um, Cheryl, you have the stage for presentation. Okay, let me share. My, I think it's sharing already. Or oh, yeah, it sure. is. Okay. All right. Yeah. Here's my screen. Yep, we can see it. That's crazy. So people are like tuning in on YouTube Live right now. Yeah, they are. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I played a lot of video games when I was a kid and fell in love with like the storytelling aspects of gaming. I, to me, the world was never such a linear, like fixed sequence of things like you would find in like more so like novels and movies. So when I saw that technology had the ability to kind of communicate experiences in a more in-depth, in a more systematic way, I was like, wow, you know, technology is gonna is the canvas of which I would like to express myself. So then, then became this pursuit of of uh, machines as an expressive tool. And so artificial intelligence um, was kind of just, I was kind of drawn to it. So I would go to like, uh, I start studying it. I was uh, wanted to eventually go and do PhD work in artificial intelligence, specifically for storytelling, because I was very interested in how we can use AI to communicate and express and, and be creative. Um, and then, so I did my graduate work uh, on that in artificial intelligence, looking at especially applications and how like games create this expressive environment and how uh, the choices and the interactions we have with technology enable our ability to understand and experience things. Yeah. So then, um, then I was like, oh, do I want to be a professor or do I want to go into industry? So I went and uh, did an internship at Google, mm -hmm. this company called Google. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it kind of just, it kind of like was, again, another, going from grad student to like Google was like a very drastic change. So, um, so I was like, you know, I think there's a lot more to learn. I noticed that after my time at Google, I was better at teaching, I was better at explaining things to people because I have the more like the the side of technology really mm. touches and like interacts with this huge population of the world. Right. Um, so then I was like, you know, like let's see like what artificial intelligence is going to become here at a company like Google. And it just so happens that last year, Sundar announced that we're an AI first company. Yeah. Right. Where like and then like I was working with the Google Brain team, and all of a sudden they move us to like the center of the Googleplex, yeah. right by Sundar's like. Like there's like a giant wall that separates us from like our CEO. So I'm like, this is like amazing to see like AI become such a central focus, this passion that I've had for like a decade. Yeah. Ever since I was a kid, I was like dreaming about the kind of video games I could make if like the technology was strong, could support me even better. Yeah. Um and specifically I met Doug Douglas Eck. Uh he's the lead on Project Magenta. Okay. He's uh he was he was like tenure track professor. He was also doing product work with Google Play Music. And then now, like, I feel like his calling is to pioneer machine learning and deep learning for, uh, for create, for like creative purposes. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to give a little intro on what that is. I really believe in the vision and the direction. It's just kind of taking off really quickly. So it's something that you guys should pay attention to you guys and gals out there. Um, in, in terms of just like, there's so much to do and so much to accomplish. And I'm just gonna give you a brief taste of what it is. And then I'll show you some more demos and um, and hopefully like it'll inspire you to join our, we have a public discussion group where people share and post the things that they're building. So mm. to all you developers out there, uh, Project Magenta, g.co slash magenta. But I'll show you that again. Yeah. Okay, okay. is that yeah. cool? Okay. Cool, okay. Um, Awesome. So Project Magenta, making music machine learning. So we're going to start. I want to show you like 
again, with all the advancements, does it sound work? Will sound work? It's not working. I might, maybe you should mute, you should turn off your sound and then we'll play from. from those from that uh, from that idea let me start this over and play yeah I don't think I can do it because I'm attached to this speaker got it I'm gonna have to play some sound sorry guys we're having some technical difficulty in playing the sound um, Maybe I can open the deck. Oh, yeah. You can open the deck. Yeah. Um, you sent it to me. Yeah. I will share that with you right now. Anyways, so like this idea of meaningful variations was, uh, is kind of the core concept in procedural content generation. Um, this is a term that comes up in the games community a lot. Like how do we, instead of scripting all the, the events in a game, that you can kind of have the game dynamically compose things on its own. So it's like an assistant to a game designer or a, um, like some sort of uh, author for the game. Um, so I shared it with you. It's coming up. Is it showing my slide deck right now? We could, yeah, it is showing your slide deck. Okay. So we can continue and then come back to it. That's we can come back to it. Yeah, we'll come back to it. So this is this is kind of the magenta um, breakdown. Breakdown. Four points. Point number one: generative models research. So you'll find like a lot of this work at uh, NIPS or ICLR, ICML, all these acronyms of, from the machine learning conferences, um, because. In, at its core, it's really looking at advancements in machine learning. And like we all, like whether or not we're explicitly being creative, we know that humans are inherently creative. And so understanding how machines learn creativity um, or extend creativity is a very important aspect and a part of this, the learning process. The other thing we do uh, is the open source community. We have a, we have a lot of code on GitHub, a lot of models that we've trained it's, uh, available to you on GitHub and for developers to kind of look at and um, and to build off of and extend on their own to their own kind of tools that they would like. Because really what we're after is that how we can, we can use machine learning and technology to be able to create these extensions of human creativity for artists and musicians. And so these are kind of the four aspects of, of, of points of engagement that you can have with uh, with machine learning. How's it going? I have the deck on. Can you play the first video and then we'll have to, I think you'll have to join and we'll have to switch. And then we can switch places maybe. But yeah, so the four areas of research that we're gonna talk about as we're troubleshooting is uh, performance RNN, Ensign Super, and Music VAE. And the reason I'm showing these is because it's the most, it's within the last month even. Some of these were announced two weeks ago, so you're getting something very fresh. But also just like the, there is the TensorFlow Dev Summit, which will be online, um, I think this week sometime, but we just had it on Friday. I gave this similar talk there. And uh, one of the big announcements is TensorFlow.js, is available, so now you can actually be um, serving these models right out of your browser. So it's like being able to to run a neural network or an LSTM or RNN directly out of your browser. All you need is a computer and internet, you know, internet connection to be able to access um, the code that runs. Um, it's going to kick me out of that other call, so we can't do that. Okay, <laughs> so. Sorry. <laughs> um, hmm, how do we play? What if I cast it? I can't cast it. You, I think you can do that. So if you go back um, yeah. into your, I think you can 
So I can screencast, start capture, share. I can go into this speaker and do a default speaker and mute it, and now you can play. Let's see if that works. Okay. Yeah. Very visual, you can visually see what's happening here. Yes, they can see what ha what's happening. Right, okay. we get the idea. It's okay. Uh, so we're switching. Yeah. So you can get you get the idea of what's happening, where you're able to generate the the drum patterns using um, just this is a web browser interface and you can log on to it now and be able to explore not just like any just not just giving you random variations right that you can actually have some sort of input and control over the type of variations that you're getting and this is done with models this is drums RNN model uh, in the magenta open source project so again that is the type of expressivity that we're talking about so, all right, so moving forward, um, nothing on sound. So this is very visual. You're not, this is just the animated GIF, so there's no sound. But there's a video after this uh, that has sound. Um, the first one is performance RNN. So performance RNN is, uh, a, when we talk about generative models or um, when we talk about creativity uh, in machine learning, people typically think of this, this idea of how do we get um, the machine to generate music and how it can learn from like a database of songs and be able to kind of reproduce the qualities mm -hmm. of that, right? So we take a large body of MIDI files and we, um, we train it, we, we, we train a neural network around it and the model that it produces is, is, is conditioned on the qualities of which we're like, like what qualities of the data we're looking for. So we have to give it some sort of intuition. So I mean, obvious things are like melodies and harmonies, right? Like what are the notes being played? But in addition to that, we've, know, we've learned over, over the months of doing this work that dynamics and expressive timing, not just like the fixed, you know, like quarter note, eighth note, 30 second, we're talking like 64th note, 128th note and beyond. Like the fact is that we're like the, the, the timing is expressive. It's not fixed into like this very specific quantization. Mm, okay. And so we train for these. Um, you should show the, just oh, kind yeah. of the idea. And what, and so, and so if you see here, you have, um, you have the ability to uh, not only just have it generated freely, but you can actually say, you know, have the, you, we're also thinking towards what kind of controls are possible. Like, you want it in a certain key. You want C major, let's say, or you want something in a whole tone scale. And of course, what you will hear is the qualities that it's learned from the data. And in this case, this is a piano competition, a Yamaha piano competition, for which they had a bunch of professional uh, pianists play classical pieces. And so we're really capturing um, not just the classical piece itself, but the performance aspects of that classical piece. And you can imagine this carries over into other domains as well. Like you really need to think about your data and what qualities you're trying to like teach the teach the machine learning model. 
Um, so people are asking if we can share the deck. Are you open to sharing the deck? Yeah, yeah, we can share the deck. Uh, let's do it like after. Right? Yeah, let after. me clean no, it up. No, yeah, right now. Okay, but after. So we'll post the deck for the audience just because so you can see the video that that show is talking about. And then um, do you want me to switch to the? Yeah, can okay. we switch? Yeah. Are we going to switch? Computers now or to no oh, okay. to the next. I think we'll just have to talk through the video. <laughs> okay, we'll talk through the video. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll I'll come back again. <laughs> Figure out. So here's the here's an example. You would be hearing classical piano music playing right now, and what we'll see is that like you get to like something like pentatonic scale, and it's building a histogram off of the notes that are being generated. And here is a uh, Nikhil. He's a Googler who worked on. TensorFlow and led TensorFlow.js, and we actually connected it to a player piano. You can see the keys are pressing itself, and so this actually this makes the installation come very much alive, where it's actually able to read in the inputs of a human and be able to respond to that. So, wow, is that the machine automatically pay, playing off of the? Yeah. Oh, wow. So the same thing that you saw, I'll show it again. So the same thing that you see here, like where you see where the, mm -hmm. the notes are highlighting. Yeah. I mean, it's basically taking in the frequent, like the, it's returning like a list of notes, right? And then yeah. the duration of these notes and how hard you press down the velocities, like the dynamics basically and the, and the timing of it, right? So here it's doing the same thing, but, but this grand piano, this baby grand piano is actually a MIDI controller. So what it is is it's it's able to do that same the same thing you see in the browser is the yeah. same exact thing that's happening. With wow, Diana. that's that's very cool. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and so and so again, uh, that like these kind of interactions of like how we engage with with music, musicians and creativity, right? And so if we were to summarize it, it looks like this: you take the classical pieces and you train a machine learning model on it using like LSTMs. Uh, some sort of sequence to sequence type mm. of model. And then what happens is we can now take this model that we build and we open source it so that people can build these front end interactions for um, engaging with these machine learning models. So we're not just thinking, oh, really cool, look at this trick that this computer learned how to do. We're thinking, how does this become a tool? Because ultimately we want the, the expert, we want to like use the expressivity, like the power of that as a as a way to extend um, the creative process. Like sometimes you, some people think of it as creating new forms of art and some people think of it as creating a new type of artist, right? Mm. Um, that this is this that TensorFlow, which is what all this is built on, all these multiple points of engagement, everything from the training of the model to like the formatting of the data to the, um, the ability to run it out of your browser is all made possible through TensorFlow. Um, that, that this is just that this really it, it like helps to extend uh, the creative process and investigate new ways that we can do that. Okay, so the next two examples use this thing called uh, a variational autoencoders. This is a, a, an approach in machine learning. I don't know if people have heard it, but like if you do a search for it um, online, there's really cool examples of this idea of variational autoencoders. And what it is, what it basically is, is this idea of taking data and encoding it, you compress it to like, let's say 100 dimensions, or like three dimensions, right? I mean, I wouldn't recommend that because you'll lose a lot of information if you reduce everything to three dimensions. But you reduce it to this like fixed set of dimensions, and then you create a space. We call it an embedding space or a latent space of that information. And then what happens is it groups things, intuitively groups things together that are similar. And so now you can, and, and, and what the variational part of it, right? Like you autoencoded the variational part um, what makes it a variation autoencoder is that now I can actually sample from pieces of that space without, um, without, uh, without having seen any example before. Mm -hmm. So it like re it's it's okay. I'll show you. So encoder decoder, right? So encoder and then the z space is the, is that is like the z vector where you're compressing it to some fixed set of weights. We all know like neural networks, right? You're training, you're going through all these layers, and then there's like one layer that's like, this is the compression layer. Mm -hmm. So let's say something, we take like a sequence of sketches, and ooh, you take a sequence of sketches, and then what happens is that sequence of ske sketches gets encoded into a, a Z space, and then gets reconstructed by the, by the model. So it tries to figure out what it looks like to be able to recreate what, mm -hmm. it, what it's been compressed as. 
And so you can see like this is the human input and then the reconstruction on the other side, you see like the, um, it, what it's learned, what it's understood. And one thing that's notable is that like if you see the, I don't know if you, they can see my, they can, okay. So if you see this cat, it only has, it has three whiskers and two whiskers on the side. When you go to the other side, it actually doesn't have a sense. It has a sense of symmetry that it's learned that whiskers are usually the same number. Oh, yeah. So it will like when it tries to reproduce, it has this like intuition. Same thing. You give it a cat with three eyes. We'll give it a second to disappear. OK, you see the, how there's like a cat with three eyes right there at the bottom. And then you go over here and it, again, it, like it, that's like an anomaly for it. Yeah. So it doesn't have an intuition for three eyed cats. <laughs> um, so this concept, then it's more than just cats, right? So we go from like cat to pig, and you can imagine as an animator, you're an animator. So yeah. we're talking about creativity, right? As an animator, they oftentimes have to like transform one thing to the next, or maybe like a, a, a certain position, like if you're doing like yoga poses or something, they're like, how do you animate one yoga pose to the next yoga pose? Mm -hmm. In this kind of, like we're training a model to have an intuition of what sketches or images or figures and forms look like. So here we can look at these, Two human inputs, and these in-between pieces are has never seen an example for before, but it can kind of derive how you go from one to the other. The old-fashioned way is that you just fade. You fade one image, yeah. like a slide, like a like a Ken Burns effect, or like you can like do these interesting little transformations with the. So I have a question. So yeah. if you apply this that we saw for the cat images yeah. to like pigs, and it's predicting what it could be, right? Yeah. Um, when we are talking about music, are we saying that while it's learning through all the different data that we fed, um, it's going to produce an output that uh, could be something new or a new form of music? Uh, yeah. Something yeah. So it's so it's gonna so like you know what, if if you feed it like uh, if you feed it music, right? Like the fear is that it's what we call it overfitting is that it just memorizes that music in right. general, right? You yeah. don't want it to do that. So you, what it does is like in the, in the what's interesting is that in the for variation auto encoders, you actually want it to reconstruct back as similar to the 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 actual like the original. Oh, you want it to be okay. as close as possible because you want it to actually learn. Like, what does it mean to go from a compression and to to reconstruct it? To reconstruct it, it. Okay. right? Yeah. But then, where the variation, where the novelty comes in, what makes variational autoencoders interesting is that you have a you have now like a space that you can explore. Mm -hmm. So you have a sense of like an intuitive space where you can you have some sort of control over the generative space. And so, like, what what where you get different things? Like, say we're we're talking about drum patterns, right? Like, mm -hmm. say you have like a salsa beat versus like an Afro-Cuban beat. Right. Now you can find like the middle point and it tries mm. to learn and then depending on how you train it or the qualities of the rhythms that you're training after, it actually has the ability to like, it's like different qualities will come out as like what it decides okay. is the mix in between. Yeah. Oh, um, so you could come up with like really cool fusion type yeah. music. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, and don't worry. So all these demos are online because again, it's in your, it just runs in your browser so you can experience it yourself. <laughs> Okay, all right. So the next project is uh, that we want to talk about is so the, these two are the variational autoencoder projects. So there's Ensign Super, and this, it takes the same idea, but you're doing like you're doing it with like sound samples. So for all people who like are using MIDI synths, this is like this is kind of in a sense just creating new new waveforms that you can you can then plug in an instrument to to control. And again, we're again we're looking at ways of controlling things. And, and it doesn't have to be two dimensions. It could be four dimensions of, or not four dimensions, two instruments. It doesn't have to be just two instruments. It's like four, right? So here, if you had set, if we had sound, we could kind of show you, and you can try this yourself later, is that like the idea of going between piccolo and guitar. Let me play it again for you. Um, so, um, so when you're when you're looking at uh, blending two sounds together, again, the easy way to do it is you play them on top of each other, right? You have like flute play and guitar play um, together. So here we have the same idea. Like here's the control of that um, with uh, with going from piccolo. Oh, I keeps jumping, but. With going from piccolo, right? There's a piccolo waveform, and then 
uh, electric guitar sample, and then the ability to be able to fly from one to the other. So the color gradient kind of represents what's happening. And yeah. so what it's doing is it's going through that latent space. Um, and then you can find the in-between, like what does it mean for me, half flute, half guitar? Oh, yeah. Yeah, electric guitar. Okay. Um, and so this is, and this is the, the technology, this is the underlying architecture for the, for what's going on, right? So you can see in the middle, there's the green circle, that's the Z space, mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the decompression, right? So you mm -hmm. take in the audio inputs, so you, and you basically, you try to compress it, and then you reconstruct it, and you figure out how to do this really well, and then with the, with the, this technology, then you, create these in between the, inter the intermediary points mm -hmm. in between two different sounds and two different inputs. So, and it's not much different than uh, going from encoder to decoder. The same kind of technology, basically, what we were talking about earlier. But when we think about tools for musicians, mm -hmm. this is a, this is a, from one of the Magenta team members of the guitar player, and so he took a picture of his setup. Um, you, you often see guitar players bring out like a, tray of uh, a tray of pedals and knobs and switches and this is very elegantly designed to control the 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 sounds that come out of their instrument right it's, yeah. it's meant to distort and to kind of give it the, the kind of tone or sound that they want you can think about like you know miles davis is known he's a trumpet player he's known for putting in the harmony mute and yeah. give it that like Miles Davis sound, like, yeah. and it's an unconventional use of technology, but that's what it means, like, when people are exercising, looking for their sounds, we want to give them the tools to do that, and we don't want them to necessarily do it like, uh, like this, right? We don't want them to do, like, like, figure out the parameter flags and <laughs> be able to write a line of Python code, or, you know, like, like that, that would be, not that it's impossible, but I think it's not thinking about the user, right. the, the who's going to be using it, what's going to be easy for them. We want to give them that experience, that that guitar pedal experience, where like they kind of can instantly and intuitively create yeah. the sound that they want to create. And so we're thinking about that. Here's kind of the representation of the research from the waveforms. So the same idea of like bass, gawkish, flugel horn, and then the center here is like the embedding space, right? So the the embedding into the uh, compression and then reconstruction back into what the sound actually sounds like and what we're doing is we're thinking about this picture on the on the right side um, we're thinking about how the hardware would actually look for this sort of interaction and here is a video showing some musicians playing and talking about the kind of hardware so we've actually so this box exists we we took it from the research and we created a uh, something that musicians will um, find more intuitive to use and had musicians use it to perform and what they thought. There's been a few public, you can kind of search for it, like Andrew Huang does a, has a video, he's a, he's a YouTuber that's uh, pretty well known for this space, and then here's another band that's used it. But we've had various musicians try it out and use it. Oh, awesome. Yeah. And we made the... Box or? Yeah, so this box was made by a, a with a collaboration uh, with the team from London. So Creative Lab London actually okay. put a, together, took the technology. So again, this idea of taking the research and then yeah. you putting it into something that's useful, um, that's usable. And what's really cool is that this project just released. So you're getting it pretty fresh, um, like two and a half weeks ago, and it's actually an open source hardware project. So we actually show all the design. Um, uh, set up with the you know potentiometers and the touch panels that go into controlling it to like the actual hardware that's mm -hmm. running on, and then um, and then all the code and the model itself is in GitHub. So you, it's like there's a GitHub page that shows this, um, and it's and it's a super project. Yeah. Okay. So we can can we add the GitHub project link also to the um, to the YouTube link. After the yeah, 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 yeah. So we will do that so you can play around and, and have fun with the project. Yeah, it's really it's again like that's the point is that like you know there's just so much to do and so much to discover. So we're trying to figure as we're developing the tools and technology yeah. here at Google, we wanna engage with the community to see like what what do they what are the needs and what's actually useful yeah. for um for building um 
and and we're open to feedback. So if you want to post comments and and adding things in it, just yeah, just yeah, post. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So going back to cats to pigs, right? That it was sound that some people like find the sound idea like pretty intuitive because especially if you work with like waveforms or raw audio, mm. you kind of have a sense for that. But of course, music is more than just sound. Um, it's also like the sequence and the duration, the melodies and the harmonies. So here's another demo that we uh, we worked on for variational autoencoders. It's called the. Um, it's using melodies to like looking at how a sequence would be represented um, in terms of tones and under, building that into a latent space and understanding what the interpolation will look like with that. And what then what then we can do with that, right, is that we can see here we're having like, if you have like four points, you can kind of take the, um, take the in-between pieces, the intermediary points of the space and be able to compose with it. So we're thinking about like what a composing, what a tool, so this tool is another tool that was worked at on another team um, here at Google, where we were taking the model and trying to figure out how we can actually create an authorial, like a way to author and compose uh, with these models mm -hmm. and the variations that we're getting. So here's a video that um, you can again try it yourself. It will be more interesting that way. And what happens? What's happening here is it's taking Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, and it's taking another melody pattern, <coughs> and then you can now stretch it apart. And then it gives you the middle point, the point in the very middle. And then you can stretch it apart even more. And it's like trying to learn. And again, like the, 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 the ability for it to have an intuition for what's happening is only as good as like how we're training it. So these models only get better. Like mm -hmm. this is like where we're at now. And some people will be like, oh, you know, it's OK. But depending on the sort of inputs you get it, or give it or how you're training it, it's gonna. It's like we're, we're constantly trying to figure out how to make it better, how to give it the controls that we want. Um, <coughs> so to review, um, you're taking you're taking like composed pieces, and then we're building this. So this is the same idea of the autoencoder, um, encoder decoder with the embedding space in between, you can see there's a little Z in the middle mm -hmm. there in that picture, um, doing the same thing with melodies. And then we're able to create these kind of tools that we open source. And then what happens is um, those, the, the, the models that we open source then become, can be used to build even more like further extensions mm -hmm. of creative tools. This is also just released, just released in the last um, couple weeks. Uh, it was released last month, and uh, all open source, all all these points of engagement possible through TensorFlow, and again, just the kind of recap showing you like like all the different parts of it that that just is just within the last month, right? These are the things that we've been at, that we've released. So it's it's an ongoing project, and things are changing fast, and there's a lot more to come. So I want to go back to this. The best thing about this demo. The drums demo, which uh, you can try out if you go to Neural Drum Machine, is that um, we didn't even know it was being made. It is using Magenta models. It just somebody took it from the GitHub project, the, uh, the Magenta GitHub project. Um, but that this is actually made by a developer, Taro, who is uh, from Finland. I think he's in the UK now. But he tweeted it. And that's how we found out. And it was just this like really pleasant surprise that they took a technology. And we didn't even we didn't even create any like public publicizing for like the release of this particular model. But he was interested enough to build this uh, user interface around it yeah. that runs in your browser. Like that's amazing. Like talk about democratization. Like the fact that people anybody can use this now. Machine learning yeah. isn't just Reserved, like the cloud enables um, people to be able to do all sorts of really cool things. Um, yeah. I've added the link to that project um, in, yeah. in our chat, so if anybody's interested. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so it's running. It runs online. We can. Uh, we and 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 really, we're just like we're barely just scratching the surface in what we can do. I think things are changing so fast since yeah. we were like AI first. Um, and the big takeaway I would, I would like for people to have um, is that we would really like for people to join the community. I can't advance anymore. Put it 
can you ask me about? Yeah. yeah. So we really want people to join the community. And then I'm going to show you a bunch of more demos. I think I deleted that. that I think that slide is no longer there, so we'll create it. We'll create a slide, a big title slide. So this is where you would go. G.co slash magenta. A little too big. G.co slash magenta. Um, where you would go to find um, the, the, the open source projects, where you find blog posts of this and more, um, where you'll be able to, um, will you be able to connect with the developers that work on Project Magenta? But Project Magenta really includes not just the people here at Google or on research. It's like such a big initiative. Like I said, there are teams in London, there are teams in New York that are building out uh, kind of the use cases for a lot of these um, these ideas and these uh, these machine learning models. But it's also beyond that, right? Like the neural drum machine was not made by uh, someone here at Google. It was made by just somebody who had an interest or had a passion or had a really cool idea that they wanted to make. Um, and so we will really invite all of you to join the website. I will, let me, I have it up here. So does it show up it on will, the screen? It will show up. OK. Yeah. Um, so here's the, the website, Magenta. This is good. It's also magenta.tensorflow.org. But if you go to g.co slash magenta, that's where it is. The, the main thing is to try out the, uh, the, the discussion or to check out the discussion group where you'll see like that takes you to like a Google group basically where there's just a lot of people actively sharing and encouraging each other. I mean, this is not just for developers. This is for like um, like artists and, and musicians and mm. people who will be using the tool, people who are like, you know, how does this work? Or it'd be yeah. great if I had this or that. And so we're thinking we're, we want to be as inclusive as possible because there's honestly just so much to do like yeah. any, any, there's like a if, if you're looking for something to contribute towards a, a community you'll find very interesting. This is it. Um, there's a whole link for the different demos that we have. Right here's like uh, on our GitHub site we have all the different demos that you can run yourself. Um, the if you so Magenta demos has its own repo, but also uh, if you go to if you go to uh, the main GitHub page, you could also see a lot of the cool um, models which you could grab from, you know, check out from um, GitHub. Uh, to show you some more, like, about Magenta, you could see the projects that we talked about are here, and you can try them out. So the links to the demos are all in these blog posts. Um, I think that one of the more most interesting ones is so here's the Ensign Super. So all the information there where you can find out about how to do that. Here's the work on piano transcription. The idea of like how we have uh, we have the ability to transcribe the conversations that we have right now. We can also do the music. Here's the performance RNN information here. Um, uh, generating music. Sketch RNN is very cool. How many people out there have tried, you know, Quick Draw? It's very, um, it's a very cool demo that. Oh, I, too I have fun with Quick Draw. I just, I love it. <laughs> yeah. So Quick Draw wasn't originally a Magenta project, but uh, is it now a Magenta project? Well, so Magenta, so so this is Quick for people who don't know. This is Quick Draw, right? So you, here, yeah, you can you can try drawing a giraffe. Giraffe, oh my god, my skills of like drawing. So it's saying like it sees a water slide, it sees a horse, a roller coaster, a mustache, Great Wall of China, flamingo, lightning, <laughs> camel, horse. <laughs> so then like a bed. That's easier. Yeah, you wanna try it again? Yeah. <laughs> so here's a bed, right? This is really fun. I mean, this is also made at Google um, by a team called Creative lab in New York. So there's Creative Lab London, Creative Lab New York. And you can actually go to AI experiments. It's a bad, it got it. It got <laughs> it. So you know what's happening, right? Is that it's creating this like, it's also creating this data set. And I got the number uh, and I was looking it up. So it's since the launch in November in 2016, they have 1.8 billion 
um, images that people have contributed to oh, quick draw. Wow. And and I was doing I did the math, and it looks like if you were to you know average it out, it would be forty images a second. Oh, wow. So they're getting like all this trained data, and this is what Magento is able to do um, with that. This will be my last. I think this is very cool. If you haven't seen it before, is the uh, sketch RNN. So they, then they're able to take that data and then create, build a model around it, right? So now, if I want to do like um, something like uh, there's so many examples, geez. Um, if I want to make a a flower. Right, here's a flower. And then if I draw like, say I draw like a circle, it's now like able to kind of complete the sequence for me. It's taking a second. Again, running, running, uh, right? It like, it's like, it's like wow. learn, it's built an intuition around yeah. this idea. Or like if I, if I clear it and then I start with this, it might try, it might think this is the petal, it might think it's the middle. Mm, right so yeah. it's like it's doing something different it has a different understanding around like what that means so this is ba trained based on how people have tried the making a flower on quick draw yeah and then learned on oh wow this yeah, is yeah 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 really, and there's just like so like and, and i know it's kind of like well how can i what will i do for this i mean i think part of it is just it's interesting because it's like it's yeah cool but we have it it's like these uh discoveries or the the, the these, uh, what we're imagining, right, is possible. And it's just like happening so fast. There's so many creative uh, applications that we're thinking of that like, that like, we really want to invite the community, the world at large to join in this discovery process. There's one, a really cool one. I just can't necessarily video. Um, the, the really, oh, here it is. It's rain um, is a really cool one. So if I clear it, it's going to train that. And then if I draw like a cloud, it's going to like oh, wow. <laughs> draw different kinds of interpretations of rain. <laughs> and then if I do like, I think if I draw like this, it will hmm. reinterpret. Yeah. So like it's, it's again, we're training. It's like the machine's just learning. Like we're, we're learning how to be better teachers of the machine. Yeah. Um, and so we're in, in having good data is a big part of that. And so that's, Kind of brings me full circle back to GCP. The GCP stuff is like I was looking at earlier. It's just that um, the, the, that uh, GCP enables or gives the opportunity for people to try out and uh, collect a lot of this data. And a lot right. of this not only runs in your own in the browser once you've built and trained the model, but a lot of the data, like uh, data storage and uh, like cloud storage. cloud storage, yeah, yeah, and uh, and then like even using cloud functions to like record. Yeah. So it's kind of like getting that crowdsourced data. Um, it's all available. And yeah, Google is, is known for um, just uh, being able to provide these kinds of services, being AI first. So yeah, that's it for awesome. my talk. Go to g.co slash magenta. Um, you know, we'll I think so, again. Yeah. yeah, just for everybody. And I put it on the, on the chat as well. So um, we just want to say thank you yeah. for coming here yeah. um, and giving this talk. Um, this is, uh, especially for me, it was very fascinating. I'm sure people who are watching uh, found that as well. I do not come from an art background or a music background and don't actually listen to a lot of music as well, which is weird, uh, but I found this very fascinating. So thank you so much for coming in. We'll post all the information that Cheryl has shared on, our, um, on the page um, below in the link. And then um, thank you so much for joining. Bye, everybody.